Statistics would tell us that 12% of the people in the room here today are actively looking for a new job. That's a fun fact, isn't it? And 45% of you are open to new opportunities on LinkedIn. So when my business partner Cheryl gives you a call, you'll take it. <laughs> now, why does that matter, right? Now think about a team of 10 and they've got the task of pulling a boulder up a hill with a rope. You've got three people at the front and they're passionate, they're hungry, they're focused on where they're heading and they're pulling at 110%. You've got six people on that team kind of really averagely holding on, hoping for the best. Some days they feel good, some days they don't. And you've got one person at the end who's hacksawing the rope, right? And we've all been on teams that are like that and it feels like that, whether you're at the front or you're the person hacksawing, because there are probably some people here today that have done that. That is really a good explanation of engagement, right? And I think now in today's day, a day and age, we're so focused on working in teams. And I'm going to show you a little bit about the insight into the science behind teams and team construct. But really, I want you to think about it from this way as well. We need to focus on employee engagement because that's what drives the customer experience. You're all responsible for either creating, designing, researching, or even delivering that customer experience. And if you're not fully engaged and emotionally committed to the organisation and your job, the team is never going to be able to live to its full potential and you'll never be able to achieve high performance. So I'd like to share with you a bit of a brief story. Um, early on in my career, I left high school. Um, now, hands up of those of you who remember going down to your local video store and renting a DVD or a VHS for your oldies. Yeah? Gone are the days, right? Now, this wonderful individual here um, is actually my sister, and her and I managed video stores across Sydney. And for the five years that I managed video stores, it was probably the happiest and most engaged I've ever been, and I've held you know, numerous executive roles, but I loved working at that video store. I loved it for a range of reasons. As store manager, I had total independence right, and, and the franchisee let me do what I needed to do. I could hire and fire and build teams. I got to build connections with people in that store. So if you were at your local video store, it's a part of your suburb. So you usually go to a video store that's in your suburb and you get to meet people in your community. Now, as someone who was sort of the centre of that, I got to build my community. And that meant on those very busy Thursday nights where you could rent $1 weekly DVDs and I had a store full of people and kids, um, it was a real opportunity to just bring people together and I had this way of doing that in my store and creating these real communities. Um, and we achieved so many awards around best stores in New South Wales and even achieved best store in the country at one point in time. And we had incredible mystery shopper results, but all of that came down to having people like myself who were designed for that job. That job was designed for me and I was really well suited. I was, I was highly engaged and motivated. So I left the wonderful world of Civic Video because obviously they deteriorated. That's actually a photo of my sister in the final weeks of one of the last video stores in Sydney closing. Um, I went on and got a job in HR um, doing administration. It looked like this. Um, it was very much about contracts of employment and data entry and making sure people had filled out their tax file declaration. I couldn't imagine a worse job for me personally. And I even spent nine months at one point in time archiving employee files. Now, can you imagine? I've come from an environment where all I did all day was talk like this. And then I had to go and sit in the basement and archive files. And I have zero attention to detail, by the way. That's in my profile. So I was actually very bad at this job. And at one point in time, I got put on a performance improvement plan. That seems quite hilarious. I'm in HR and I'm getting performance managed because I can't ch check letters. And I put she instead of he on a letter, right? And I worked with this woman, Carol Lee, and she was so passionate about her job. She loved letters, she loved printing papers, she loved checking checklists, she loved data entry. 
And I used to look at her and think, who are you? Like, why do you love this so much? <laughs> and obviously, she was very good at her job. So there was something to be admired about how good she was at her job and I could just never operate at that level. And it's interesting when you think about it because you've got two people in the exact same organisation, we had the same manager and we're in the same job, but we have very different engagement levels. We have very different performance levels. So why is that? And I'm going to share with you a little bit about my profile and why that was never going to work. Now, I then went on to an organisation called SAS Institute. Now, they are a very large global software company and they specialise in predictive analytics and especially around big data, they have very, very big global clients. Now, it's no surprise that as a predictive analytics company, they use predictive analytics on people inside their organisation and they used a tool called the Predictive Index. Now, not only did they care about their, their customer, is they cared about us and we were the most important thing for them as a business. And they went on to win global awards, best place to work ahead of Google, actually back at the time. But what they did is they truly understood the individuals inside the organisation and understood the science behind what made us all tick. And we were no longer numbers, we were people. And the programs we designed, and I loved that job as well because I had an opportunity to really understand each person, their needs, their drivers, and really help them understand their teams better. So what's interesting about all this is that often we delegate this to HR, don't we? Because it's like, ugh, that's people problems. You can help us recruit. You know, I'll do a technical interview. Hands up if you've done a technical interview. Make sure someone actually has the skills, knowledge, and capability to do the job, right? And then we often leave the soft stuff to HR. You can sort out whether they're a good person, can't you? Um, but it's interesting because when we go to hire someone, we look at what's in their briefcase, don't we? The good old CV. Everyone loves to be judged on their CV. And that's how we do recruitment, right? We look at your CV and we say, have you done this style of work before? Because if you've done this style of work before in another company, you can do it here. And we're definitely going to get a better result out of you here because we're better and we're different, right? And sometimes we might ask an engagement question around values. So what are your values and your ethics and are you going to fit into the culture here? And that's ultimately all we look at when we recruit. But this is not ever going to really predict performance. And it's not going to predict engagement either. And a really interesting fact, um, I was looking at some KPMG and Deloitte data. They've done global research on engagement over 20 years. And they're saying global engagement's gone from 30% in 2000 to 34% in 2018. Now for you analytic people in the room, that's a 4% increase on engagement and they've spent roughly $1 billion in the US alone. So even though we're throwing money at this problem around engagement, we're giving you nice comfy offices, we might be giving you fruit baskets and Krispy Kremes on a Friday, none of that is fixing our crisis. None of that is actually gonna make you feel more fulfilled at work. What we really need to be thinking about is what's going on up here. We need to understand you as a person and what drives you. We need to know what your drivers are so we know what motivates you. And we need to know what motivates you so we can have a look at your behaviours and how you like to turn up to work. And this is really the foundation for what we need to do. Now, I said to you earlier, we love to, I guess, delegate this to HR, or we rely on our gut instinct. And the reason why HR is struggling in this industry, and I can say this because I've come from the world, is that we haven't gone enough on, on an evolution journey. So back in 1919, that's actually the first time they introduced eight-hour workdays. Prior to that, it was not defined. Lucky them. And then we moved into ha uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs, which some of you should be f familiar with that philosophy, which really said we need more than food and water. We need purpose. Um, and then we moved into personnel, so for those of you who were around in the workforce at that time, you had your personnel departments and they just pushed paper. HR then got introduced in the 90s and we then started to evolve. We had L&D, we had REM and benefits, make sure you got paid well. And then we might include some benefits there as well because HR people love programs that make you feel good, don't they? Love organising your Christmas party. I used to love it when the CEO used to say to me, 
Alicia, what's happening for the Christmas party this year? And I'd say, I don't know, what have you planned? <laughs> right? It's <laughs> and it's true, right? Um, we need to go on a further journey. And what's interesting is it's not HR's fault. <laughs> it's a real big issue around tools. So we've actually not enabled them with the data and the insights. So the amount of investments that we have now in the customer experience, we are not applying that internally. We're not looking at, at our employees like we do our customers. And so I'd like to introduce to you the concept of talent optimization, and this is what we're going to talk through, and I'm going to share with you the discipline and the model. And I'd really like you to think about your own organisations. Now, when we have a look at the um, employee experience space, you've got sort of these two axes. And you've got things that improve process and people, and then things that are tactical and strategic. And HR systems like your HRIS, things that you use to log in and maybe get your leave logged. Um, they might be some communication tools, um, applicant tracking when you've been recruited for a role. Yeah, really important. These things are very important, but they're just one piece. And then we move across into improving people and we have employee development and that might be looking at well where are you going as an individual and maybe sending you on a training course and improving process and especially looking at strategic is a lot of companies and most companies have come from a world of performance reviews yeah where you do your annual review and they give you a score who likes to be scored nobody nobody wants to be scored right your managers perception on how well you're doing because you know that's accurate, isn't it? Um, but what we need to think about is a, is a model that will allow us to do all of these things, but also think strategically about aligning our talent to our business strategy so that we can achieve on our results. So this is talent optimization. Most organizations, hopefully all of your organizations, have a strategic plan, right? This is, we've got a strategy, we know where we're heading, we know how we're going to go to market, we know what our customer base is, and we know what we need to do. That's usually underpinned with a financial strategy, an operational strategy, some systems and technologies, and we're trying to get over to the other side. We're trying to get to these business results, right? And often they're financial, but sometimes it might be net promoter scores, and there are a range of other metrics that we have in business. But this giant chasm in the middle that no one pays enough attention to is you. It's talent. It's the people that actually have to go out and execute on that strategy. And it's making sure that we have the right people in the right roles and we know how to inspire you. And it's a very simple concept, but not a lot of organisations are doing it. So what we've got to give us some structure, because you're all analytics people, let me give you some structure, is we first must design. Like anything we do, we must design. We must sit back and have a look at our organisation. What is our strategy? Where are we heading? What roles do we need? Is our leadership team fit to deliver on our strategy? Do you have a current way to assess if your leadership team are in alignment with your strategy? Probably not, right? And I'm going to share with you some executive teams I've sat on and how we've done this. And then we need to go out and hire against the jobs that we've created and get really good fit. We need lots of Carolees in that HR admin job and we need to fire me very quickly and we need to find me another opportunity in the organisation. And we need to do those things quickly. Another really interesting statistic, we did some research into 600 executives and they said 50% of their um, hires last year were bad hires. That is shocking, right? So we're getting the recruitment process wrong time and time again, yet we're not really moving the dial on it. So we need to get better at hiring, making sure we've got the right people in the right roles, assessing people, seeing if they're in alignment, predicting team dynamic. Okay, every time you add a new person into your team, it shifts the dynamic, doesn't it? because you've got a new flavour, a new person, new dynamic. And we have to find ways to inspire, to give you growth, to give you career progression. And it's an interesting thing, and I've, I've said this to a few potentiators, at the end of the day, you're not going to be here forever, right? Let's just have an honest conversation. 
you're not going to be in your company for the rest of your life until the day you retire. Our job as an organisation is to make you a better person than before you walked in the door. And for you, you need to tell us what better looks like. Does that mean you have new skills? Does that mean you've had really interesting experiences? Does that mean you've learnt something, that you've grown? What is it? You tell us what that looks like and then let's build you a plan. And sometimes people aren't com confident and capable enough to have those really o open and honest conversations. So once we build all that, we have to look at how do we diagnose, how do we assess, how do we again introduce data into the conversation and really measure how we're going so that we can continue to improve how we're doing. Now, all organisations, when they create their strategy, they fundamentally fall into some certain areas. And I'm going to introduce to you the competing values framework. Um, it's quite a famous concept um, that's been turned into a model. And I'd like you to think about the organisation you're in today, right? We've got some really diverse range of clients here today. So I'd like you to think about your organisation and where you think you play the heaviest in this model. So we've got the companies that focus on innovation and agility. Now what's interesting about this quadrant is it's organisations who are trying to break the model. They're trying to do something different that no one's done before. Think of your Ubers and your Airbnb. It's taking something and disrupting it, right? And doing something different. A lot of companies like to think they play here, but often they don't play purely here. There'll only be a small component of their strategy that sits here. And then we move down into results and discipline. Now this is where I see the majority of my clients sit. It's where we're trying to be the best. We want to grow. We want market penetration. We want to make sure that what we do, we're seen as the go-to in our, in our industry. And it's very focused on profitability, delivering results, accountability. And there's a range of other things that sit here, but that's at its core what it looks at. Hands up if you think your organisation sits on this right-hand side of the wheel. A few, good. And then we move down into process and precision, so the left-hand side of this wheel. There are organisations like engineering firms, right? They're manufacturing-style organisations. Uh, hospitals, when I work with hospitals, they're often here as well, because at the end of the day, I don't want them taking risks with people's lives, do I? It's about efficiency, it's about making sure that things are done to a very high standard. We need that excellence. And then you've got organisations with a heavy focus on teamwork and employee engagement. And sometimes you'll have a very sprinkle here, and let's hope you do. Some organisations don't. We're just not focused on that right now. Um, we're going to play and operate in different quadrants. So I'd like to share with you an example of how we do this in the real world, because right now you're just thinking, that's really nice, Alicia, you've put some coloured boxes up on the screen. We'd like some takeaways. So I worked on a senior executive back in 2016. I joined a firm and got a call from the CEO. She said, look, we're 15 people big. We've got to get to 80 to 100 people in a couple of years. We've got to do it and we've got to do it fast. Now, who knows the number one rule of scaling an organisation and what is probably the most critical factor? Who wants to guess? Participation, everybody. You can put your hand up. Anybody? Pardon? People. Exactly right. And actually, it's people, it's retention. You can't scale a fast-paced startup unless you can retain, right? If you can't retain your people, you can't keep growing. And I've worked with lots of startups that just can't get the momentum because they keep losing people, right? So you can't scale and grow unless you can retain. And she knew that and she said to me, Alicia, the most important thing we focus on is not only achieving our goals, but it's actually about the culture that we create and we ensure that we keep our good people. And in fact, everybody we hire will be good, so we have to keep them all. So we sat down and here's just a bit of a screen grab of um, how we did it in the tool. And you can see some of those very dark purple in that top right hand quadrant. We did a strategic assessment and it mapped out where we played in the tool. It said, here is where you play based on your strategic plan. And you can see as a startup in a new space trying to do something very innovative, we needed to play very heavily up there. But you can see two markers up on teamwork and employee experience. And this is as my role on the executive team 
are really focused on making sure that we can deliver on that part of the strategy. And you would say, as an executive team, we're pretty well aligned, right? We're sort of weighted where we should be. So we were a great team. We were high performing. The first 18 months there, man, we ran 100 miles an hour. I loved working there. We built this amazing team and a major co amazing culture. We got to 50 people big. What do you think happened? We broke. We broke because can you see that there is no process there? What happens when a company has no process? I can't onboard people fast enough. I'm spinning my wheels. The company isn't focusing on billable realization targets. Timesheets are all over the place. We can't send invoices to the customers. We got people sending out proposal proposals that haven't been approved, right? Because we didn't have the process and precision that we needed. And we sat down as an executive team and I could just all day, I was listening to the same thing going around in circles. This part of the, pro the division doesn't have process. We, and I boiled it down. I was like, we don't have enough process. So we reevaluated our strategy and we redid this process. And you can see that when we reevaluated our strategy 18 months later, it's different. It's now weighted in delivering a little bit more on, on results and discipline, because we need a little bit more of that, accountability. But you can see the process and precision is now highlighted. We need to do something in this space if we are going to save this business. Now what's interesting is I can't go and fire that executive team. This is the executive team I have and in fact we're a very high performing team. The challenge here is nobody wants to operate in process and precision. And we can say that we do and we can, but guess what, no one's going to. It's gonna be delegated. So that meant that we created two new positions in our organization. This is strategic design people. When we strategically design roles in alignment with our strategy, and this really interesting individual MC on the right-hand side, in the results and discipline, we actually called her the enforcement officer. What a great job title. And interestingly enough, she was ex-military. And she was amazing. Like, I have never met such an amazing woman in my life. And she just got in and got shit done. But she held everyone accountable. So she would set up something, and she would ring you and be like, you haven't filled your timesheet in and it's Friday at 2.05, you're five minutes late. So she was really good at really holding people accountable, but you can imagine then working with an executive team that doesn't like to follow process. So I'd have the CEO ringing me going, Felicia, I can't get contracts of employment approved because this person is asking me to tick a box and reply to an email. I said, yes, that's exactly why we employed her. Stop getting agitated because we have strategically hired this person and she's gonna save your ass. Right? She's going to make sure that our customers pay us. She's going to make sure that we've got our um, realization targets on track. But I had to show her this again and say, this is why she's causing you pain, but you need this person. You need to understand the way that their mind works. And these tools become a great foundation for the conversation rather than this knee-jerk reaction we do as humans, right? We respond and go, that was annoying, you're annoying, why don't I just get rid of you? We can't operate business like that. We need to strategically design our teams. We then need to think about designing our culture that's in alignment with that. And one of the interesting exercises I do with companies is, and when I meet CEOs, I say, tell me a little bit about your culture. Now that may seem like a very simple question. I struggle to meet CEOs who can answer that. And what's even more I don't see is when I ask executives that they're in alignment. Another interesting thing I see is when organizations' culture is misaligned with their strategy. Good example, met with an insurance firm the other day. And I met with a member of the executive team and I said, tell me a little bit about your culture. And they said, we've got these values. And the CEO has told us the most important value that we must all focus on, keep in mind it's an insurance company, is entrepreneurial. <laughs> now, for those of you who know what that actually means, it means high risk, right? It means breaking things. You're an insurance firm going through a royal commission. Why would you ask people to take more risk? It seems like a value that's it's just clashing with actually what you're being set out to do, which is protect the company from royal commission and decisions that are being made and to actually clean up. So 
Again, I see this happening time and time again. Think about your culture. Where would it fit? You've had to think about where your strategy might be. Is your culture in alignment with that strategy? Because this is really important to make sure we get alignment. So there are certain quadrants here and you can see as it moves around, there are different values that are associated with those cultures. So how do we predict behaviours, right? And you're all probably going, how did you get all those people on the wheel? So we use a tool to do that and it's very simple, takes five minutes. Um, and we look at how much of a certain drive you have. And we look at four drivers, the dominance drive, the drive to exert influence on people and events and how much of that you have. And if you have a low amount, you just have different styles of behaviours, more teamwork, more um, service driven. We've got extroversion, probably a little bit more familiar with you, how much connection you like at work. And then patience, which is how much stability and structure and routine you like. And formality is the drive to conform to rules and structure. So in the tool, we can map out, well, where do you sit? And everybody sits in a different position because everyone is different and everyone is unique. But this helps us predict how you turn up to work, how you build relationships, how you approach risk, how you influence. It helps us really understand you better. And then we can obviously go out and recruit people. So the old way is looking at that briefcase and the new way is actually profiling jobs and saying, what are the drivers of a job? And is this person well suited to the job? It is a very simple concept, but tools help us to be able to do this rather than relying on our gut instinct all the time. And the last thing I wanna share with you is a model that I built a couple of years ago when I was trying to get people to evolve into employee experience. And I built it this way where we had company-driven activities, things like the software and technology you have inside your business, the vision values and branding that you have and how clear is it? And how attractive is it when people are looking to you to join you? Equality, diversity, inclusion, how well are you doing it or not doing it? You know, Not that you should have a quota, but are you thinking about it? And then work environment. You do want people to feel proud about coming to work where they're working and they're comfortable and they have what they need. And then from an individual perspective, what's their recruitment onboarding process been like? How do they feel about reward and recognition? Because guess what? Based on your profile, I can predict how you like to be rewarded. I've got people who like to be on stage to be rewarded. I've got people who like private recognition. I've got people that like team recognition. We all like to be recognised differently. And if I know that, I, I can do that much quicker and easier and meet your needs. How would you assess your leadership in your organisation? Do managers have the right skills? Because managing people is the most complex job because people are complex. And then we move into growth and development and that's probably one of the main things people leave an organisation for. I've stopped growing. So what growth and development are we giving people? And finally, health and wellbeing. And I think this pretty much sums up employee experience and the things you should be thinking about but I'd like you to really challenge yourself and think how are we assessing that we're doing this entire model, but also how are we getting to know and understand our drivers and needs of our employees? Do we know if that role is suited to them? And if it's not, where to coach? Do we know if our teams are in alignment? Can we predict how a team is gonna interact? How will two teams interact with each other when they're very different? So. I'd like to leave you with a final note, which is how do you lead your pack? How do you lead? How do you turn up to work? Do you have a high level of self-awareness and does everyone else understand how to work best with you? And if you're sort of asking yourself that question, I'd like to know more, I've got a curious growth mindset, I'd encourage you to go to our website and you can take a free PI behavioural assessment and I can go through your results with you very quickly. Um, and my job is really to help people understand themselves and that they can go back to work and apply this across teams and strategy and do it holistically. But for you in the room today, self-awareness is key. So I hope you have enjoyed.